Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Ira Price. I'm a physician in Ontario. I've been working with medical cannabis probably for almost a decade now. And uh, there's been a lot of up and downs, that's for sure. And today I'm going to um, be moderating as well as giving a talk in the afternoon. Nine o'clock is still like, I don't know, it's like 12 o'clock for me, so I should be awake, but I'm actually not. Um, it's, I've been, I literally got off a plane from New York, like from New York, jumped on a plane to here. And anyway, so I'm a little bit tired, but and I, I can almost read. Any, how many physicians do we have here? Because we, you know, when we can't spell, we scribble, right? That's that's why you can't read our scripts. And our reading capacity is like is super slow. I didn't become a lawyer, and sometimes I feel like I should have. I just didn't want to read so much. So I am going to do uh, all the intros, and. Um, and yeah, and let's, so let's get started. The first speaker that I'm going to introduce is David Ostro, a cannabis and cannabis meets healthcare. We're going to talk about new opportunities and challenges in community based therapeutic research. Uh, and I'll just read the bio here. Since the late 90s, Dr. Ostro has been active in uh, changing failed national drug policies such as cannabis prohibition uh, and the resulting barriers to medical cannabis research in the US. Over the same period, Dr. Ostro has been organizing a community-based patient-centered clinical cannabis evaluation and research network. Now, that name, is there like the acronym CBCCERN? Is there, is there a short form for that? It's long. CBCERN, that's what I'll call it. It's a good name. Still in the pilot feasibility stage, he is presently preparing a series of papers uh, describing the C, B, C, C, Earn, uh, rational methodology and uh, types of therapeutic research questions that can be addressed through pros prospective observational research. The NA, uh, C, B, C, C, E, R, N uh, would establish standardized longitudinal observational data, collect, uh, data yeah, collection on hundreds of thousands of medical cannabis patients being treated for qualifying conditions in state, in state authorized medical cannabis programs. The ultimate goal of these uh, current clinical efforts is the identification, I felt like stopping there and just doing a little Friends episode, identify, okay, all right. um, do that, uh, anyway, okay, okay, so we get it. Identification of effective harm reduction, wellness oriented and compassionate treatment guidelines and policies including integration of medical cannabis training into the uh, medical and other PHCP training curriculum. Dr. Ostro's next career step is the clinical director of Valio programs for LGBTQ persons at Chicago Lakeshore Hospital. He plans to util utilize his broad range of experience in further development of integrative uh, therapies for complex mental health and addiction patients often in the context of debilitating chronic physical health conditions, uh, not adequately responsive to our current therapeutics. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce them. Well, we just did that, but here you Well, I'm so pleased to be here and to see you all awake and smiling at this hour. And um, it's a little early for me too, coming from Chicago, but um, I've been here for four days, so I've gotten, I've gotten used to the time shift already. So I think that uh, b both Ira and Kevin kind of gave me the perfect opening. Because the reason I call it uh, the uh, community-based and patient-centered is that uh, the whole paradigm for, for drug development that has developed in, in Western medicine really it does not work when it comes to cannabis, okay? It's based on isolating single molecules that have action at a single site in the body that may or may not affect an animal or a laboratory model for human disease, and very often um, has effects that are not the ones that the patients uh, are looking for. So my own career has been spent doing what I call mixed method research, and that is you start out by asking the patient population what are the questions that they want answers to. You don't assume that you know what they are. And, and I think in, in medical cannabis, uh, this is very true. And I'm going to go through some of the history uh, here. Um, 
Now, do I uh, advance the slide somehow? Yeah, I just see a slide, a slide the This thing here? Oh, <laughs> So, anyway, here's, this is just to give you a, an historical perspective. And you have a, a, a very parallel perspective here because I think the first real breakthroughs occurred. Um, in the late 90s here, just about the same time that California first uh, uh, passed the first medical cannabis uh, program. But the thing we have to really keep in mind is that there was a great experiment of prohibition, and that was alcohol. I don't think you had it, you had prohibition of alcohol in Canada because um, my city, Chicago, was a very famous transit point for all the alcohol coming <laughs> to the United States. Um, and uh, we should have learned our lesson from that, okay? That prohibition doesn't work. If it's, if it's, if it's something, a drug, a food, or gambling, whatever, that people want, they will find it. And all you do is push them into the black market by prohibiting it. Um, in fact, when uh, it was made, uh, it took several steps for, for the federal government to uh, effectively outlaw marijuana. First, they had a thing called, they had to have a marijuana tax stamp, only they didn't issue the stamps. So, a very enterprising young uh, Harvard uh, professor by the name of Timothy Leary sued the federal government, and that was one of his lasting contributions. He had that law overturned. And so then they uh, decided, well, we're going to create this thing called Schedule 1, which is going to contain a list of drugs for which there is no known or potential um, therapeutic uses and are among the worst narcotics and addictive, addictive substances known to man, and we're going to put cannabis in there. Now, why did they put cannabis in there? Anybody want to take a guess? Did it have anything to do with the properties of the drug or the, or the plant? No, it was because of the people who used it, okay? They got a twofer. Yeah. Um, just like, you know, we have these caravans of people from Central America coming up. Back then, the fear was Mexican migrant laborers, and during the, during the smoke breaks, they didn't go with the, with, with the uh, uh, rangers. They went off on the side and they smoked that loco weed, you know, and so... Uh, they were considered uh, foreigners. And then the blacks, after the Civil War, and the sudden moving up and off, and they were a threat. They were going to take your, your sons and daughters and make them into their sex slaves or whatever, and all they had to do was give them a smoke on a marijuana cigarette. And there's a whole thing that if you, if you watch movies like uh, Reefer Madness, you, you know that whole story. But um, what you may not know is that the Hearst newspapers played a very major role in it because they were the ones that were putting out these news stories in all the newspapers, and they had you know, control of at least California and the rest of the states. And they printed it at their papers on yellow paper because it was cheaper than white paper, and that's where the term yellow journalism comes from. Is, is the Hearst campaign is marijuana. But at the time, the AMA president actually testified against prohibit, prohibiting the cannabis because he said it's going to interfere with doctors and the medical science field understanding what the potential uses of this drug is. Okay? Now, so skip forward to like the last 30 years and the AMA is lockstep with the government and the pharmaceutical companies and, and the war on drugs that it's a good thing that, that uh, cannabis is, is prohibited. And um, I think uh, it's wonderful that you're showing the way here in Canada, and I think it's going to push the United States uh, to move, it, move ahead much faster. Um, in the 1980s, and I'm going to talk about AIDS a little bit more, it was actually AIDS patients that led the, um, uh, the, the, the actual activism to get uh, medical cannabis passed in California. In fact, Dennis Perone, who died just a few months ago, was really the, the person who, who fought that battle. And um, uh, it was really very important. And um, because what, what was happening was people were suffering. There was no treatment. And what treatments there were were, uh, were very debilitating. They were wasting away and everything. 
So the volunteers were baking brownies with marijuana in it and giving them out in the uh, uh, clinics where the patients were being seen. So they can, as a compassionate gesture, they weren't selling it, they were, they were giving it to them. And eventually, uh, California became uh, known for establishing the first medical cannabis program. But what they didn't do was put, to, put together any regulations about how it was going to be grown, under what conditions, how it was going to be sold, or whatever. So it was the Wild West all over again. And, at, and as a result, what we have now is programs are being set up that are very highly regulated. I would say over-regulated. In, in, in Illinois, um, our soon-to-be former governor would not even include pain in the list of recognized uh, conditions. So they, the assembly had to pass a special bill that allows a new pain patient to take an opioid prescription to a dispensary, and that dispensary can give them um, medical cannabis uh, during the 90 to 120 days it would take them to get a state uh, license to use it. Um, and if you and if you have severe pain, you're not you're not going to you're not going to wait 90 to 120 days to get your cannabis. You're going to start taking opioids, and you're going to be addicted to them uh, long before you have it. So um, we're suffering we're suffering in part for the lack of forethought. But but if you look now at California, there's like I think 50 to 80 bills now in the legislature where. Uh, to re-regulate and change and fine-tune all the different aspects of both uh, medical and recreational. And I hear from the discussion just at breakfast here that you're going through some kind of a transition here now as to what is the relationship going to be between medical cannabis and recreational cannabis. And I, my, my only advice is try to preserve some way to keep track of who is on medical cannabis and for what reason, because otherwise we'll never learn uh, what what it, are the best therapies for things? Okay, so the result of all this is that cannabis is, is unique. And there was an editorial just last week, I think, in the New England Journal of Medicine about this. It's illegal on the federal level, but it's legally sold in the majority of states where the vast majority of U.S. citizens live. Okay. The states that have it passed it, the only, the only state that has a sizable population is Texas. And we know that's a separate country to begin with. So. <laughs> <laughs> and if you talk to doctors, they're either for it or against it. There's very few people who say, well, I've got to learn more. They either have bought the government's line, hook and singer, because it, we're taught it. You know, it it's, it's propaganda that every medical student and pre-medical student, every nurse really, is given. You're only taught about the negative things about cannabis. And at the same time, we don't have good scientific data. Why don't we have good scientific data? Well, if you prohibit a drug, and you also prohibit the importation of that drug for studies, and the only person who, the only organization that can produce that drug is the National Institute for Drug Abuse. <laughs> and as they say, abuse is our, is, is our last name, so they only sponsor studies of the negative consequences of uh, cannabis use. So there's no way that a drug company can do a study because the FDA requires you to use the very same material in your study that you're going to market uh, uh, if the study is successful. Now, we all know that um, GW just got approval for its uh, pure CBD form, Vepidio, Dialex, or whatever, uh, how they pronounce it. Um, but it's a very interesting side story to that. The actual formulation uh, that Ethan Russo put together was 20 parts CBD, 1 part THC. Because according to the uh, entourage effect, which I'm going to talk about uh, for the rest of the talk, you have to have some THC in there to get maximal efficacy of the CBD for whatever it's doing and to, and to reduce the side effects that you might otherwise have. And the FDA said, well, we're going to tell everybody that we may just take that out because there's not enough safety data on giving THC to children. The actual reason was, they said, if you leave it in there and you do the study, 
we won't be able to schedule it in a way that doctors will be able to prescribe it. Okay? So there's an example where prohibition actually leads to us having an inferior medication, and there are deaths related to the fact uh, that, that uh, the lack of THC causes much more side effects, much more interactions, negative interactions, and adverse uh, side effects. And um, uh, there's a whole movement among uh, pack families uh, of children with this to try to get the FDA to back down on this. Or they, or they go and they get Rick Simpson's oil, because that's the original uh, substance that they need. Um, so the bottom line is doctors are either on one side or the other. They're saying, where's the data? And we, we can't show it to them. Or they've seen it themselves. They've either taken it themselves for pain or some other condition, or they have family members. I find that older people are our best advocates, because so many of them have, have, have diseases like cancer, and arthritis, and so forth, and have gotten relief from medical cannabis. So it, it really comes down to your attitudes and, and your own experience, rather than any facts or science. And that's unfortunate, because that means that what's driving the industry uh, that we're going to hear about in the next two days is not science, but marketing and and kind of like the mystique of you know pure CBD is like uh, great because it doesn't have any THC in it and, and and it doesn't even you can make it and ship it wherever you want and sell it online and so forth. But it's actually not a real a real whole cannabis product. Okay. So that brings me to the subject of my talk, and that is what can we do in our day-to-day -day lives, either as a patient, a doctor, a dispensary, cultivator, lab, etc., that will allow us to figure out what are the key elements of a compassionate and uh, safe and effective treatment for a specific uh, illness. And it's not just my idea, many people have suggested what we need to do is have a patient registry. Every patient that starts on uh, medical cannabis, their doctor ha has a set of data they must collect on that patient, other conditions, and so forth. And then they, they're, they're not given a prescription, they're given a recommendation. And then they get a license from the, from the state authority. <laughs> but then they go to a dispensary, and basically non-medically trained people tell them what products they should use for whatever. Sure. So there isn't, there isn't that kind of, there's a forced separation. Uh, normally, the doctor would look at you, gather your symptoms, your history, do the exam, look at your lab test, and then write a prescription for a specific drug and a specific dosage and, and so forth. That, that's totally not, not happening in, in the medical cannabis field. It's been totally separated off. And in fact, I don't know about here, but in the United States, it's illegal for a doctor to own a dispensary and vice versa. It's it seen as anti-competitive. So um, we really have to look for other models of research uh, that will help us here. So I made a list. Well, I'm going to digress first and talk about AIDS, only because this is how I got into cannabis research. As a psychopharmacologist, and along the way, I discovered that um, hepatitis B was transmitted sexually among gay men. And so I ended up being the principal investigator of the multi-center AIDS cohort study, uh, at least the Chicago part of it, which was and still is the largest study of the natural history of HIV and now the treated history and, and aging and people with HIV. And um, that happened because we knew absolutely nothing. When the, when the disease first occurred, all we knew is that people showed up in emergency rooms or doctor's offices with no T lymphocytes. As, as if some, by magic, their immune system had totally been destroyed. But it hadn't happened overnight. It turned out it was like a 10 year or longer process leading up to it. Well, we didn't know that. We just knew that these people were on death's door and they were going to come down with any infection that normally their immune system would be able to fight off, and it was just a, a matter of time. So the initial scientific and medical response, I have to say, was appalling. You know, people were so frightened by this unknown disease that they didn't want 
children, hemophiliac children, to go to school with their kids because they might drink from the same water fountain and give it to them. They wanted gay people tattooed so that anybody who before they had sex would know that they were positive for this disease. And there were all kinds of really negative things. And um, Ronald Reagan was the president. And um, he didn't want to see any uh, pressure being brought by a, a disease lobby on the appropriation process. So he had his uh, assistant secretary of health uh, tell the, the Congress that they didn't need any money for AIDS research. They were doing everything possible. And um, what happened was there were five of us, five different groups around the country, that had submitted applications to NIH, all of which had been approved but not funded. And because of Senator Dianne Feinstein and uh, Representative Green from New York, who were both elected on a platform of doing the government doing more about AIDS, one of the major things, uh, had us testify before the uh, uh, Appropriations Committee about our grants. And the head of that committee was, was a guy named Natcher, an old Southern gentleman. So he called back in the next week the um, assist, assistant secretary, and he said, you told us you didn't need any money, but I had these, all these scientists in here last week, he even read our grants in the federal record, and they showed us that they have proposed studies that would, that would really help us understand their disease, and, and they did not get funded. And Brand said four things. I may have misspoke. And Natcher just took his hammer and said, Okay, four million dollars for AIDS research, and that was the first money. And then I had every single NIH agency trying to, to fund the, the study. Because uh, each one now was sort of was money for them, so they all wanted to have a piece of the pot. So what happened that changed everything about AIDS? Why did it go, go from being a pariah to being something that people wanted to see uh, worked on and, and conquered? Well, babies and hemophiliacs started coming down with it. So we had the term, the innocent victims, uh, started coming around. Rock Hudson died of AIDS. And Rock Hudson was a good friend of, of Ronald Reagan. Um, and uh, he was the guy that always got the girl in the movies. So that was another one. And Randy Schultz wrote a, a really amazing book. It's one of the most frequently unfinished books, because I think it runs about 790 pages. But it really chronicles, you know, all the missteps in the government and in the private medical field and so forth, and, it, and even in the communities affected, that led to the, that crisis becoming so bad before anything was done about it. And then there was ACT UP and other groups that were very persistent. They, for the first time, they decided they were going to do die-ins at pharmaceutical companies, and the NIH, and, the, and at the New York Stock Exchange, and so forth. And some of those people are still around, and they're still leading uh, the movement, the activist movement. So, um, and then a very important thing happened. The Surgeon General, who was a holdover from a previous administration, um, because they're not appointed, they're appointed by the president, but they, they don't have a, a term that runs with the presidency. He insisted on sending a booklet to every household in America that AIDS, what is it? What do we know about it? How, what do we know how it's transmitted? And it was to make people understand that this was like any other disease. You had to take precautions and do certain things, but it wasn't going to, you know, hit you on the head if if you you know turn turn the wrong way and so forth. So that was very important, and uh, he was eventually fired for doing that. But uh, <laughs> it was his great moment in time. And then Luc Montagnier gave a sample of the virus to Robert Gallo, and so they both became the co-discoverers of HIV. And it really was a, basically a new class of, of virus. There had been human retrovirus already known, but they caused the lymphocytes to expand. And this was the first one that actually killed lymphocytes in the process of um, replication. And so here we are today, some 30 years after that, and in fact, it was here in Vancouver in 1996 where the, 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 the uh, durable treatment for HIV and AIDS was announced during the AIDS conference here. Um, 
and, and hundreds, at least, at least a million, probably more like two million deaths worldwide, and hundreds of billions of dollars later, and we know everything pretty much that you could know about this virus, every step in its replication and so forth, and we have engineered molecules to stop the virus at every stage, and that's why it's called a cocktail, because you have to have the virus mutates at such a rapid rate that one or two drugs are not enough. You have to have three, sometimes four drugs to keep it from uh, accumulating enough mutations uh, and escaping that. And that's one of the reasons why there has not yet been a vaccine for this, for this thing. So um, it's going to take that kind of a, I call it like a Marshall Plan to really advance cannabis from where we are now to where we want to be. So here are some of the models, and it's very arbitrary uh, how I've paired them, but the important thing is that the ones on the left are the ones that, um, oops, the right. ones on the left are the ones that are used now to develop drugs, and the ones on the right are the ones that I think we have to start using maybe in conjunction with some of the ones on the left because this is a very different pedal of fish than, than any other drug uh, that's been developed. You know, the history of modern pharmaceuticals is, so you have a, you have a tincture of belladonna or something, you have a, a plant uh, extract, but you want the, the drug company, before they can invest millions of dollars in doing the testing of that, they want to have something they can patent. So they have to isolate the active molecule and either get a use patent on that by doing the studies or, or manipulate it slightly so that it, it's, it's proprietary information and then they can put it through the 30 to 100 million dollars it takes to go through phase one, two, and three and then maybe one out of 10 or one out of 100 drugs makes it and uh, but then they have to charge thousands of dollars for a gram of that drug. So if you think about what cannabis would cost if it was tested through that whole system, um, you, you realize that that, that that pathway is not going to help us. So we have to think more that we focus on the whole plan and the extracts from it. And we have to make the research patient-centered. And the clinical community-based model is that the data is being collected in the community as it's being Generated. In other words, the doctor who is seeing the patient for the first time is collecting the data on which they base their diagnosis and their recommendation. The patient is keeping a diary of what the effects are. And it only, this only works, my, my system only works in states where you, uh, it's a closed loop system. Like in Illinois, you cannot grow your own, you cannot import it from another state, you must buy it from a licensed dispensary and they must keep records of what they sell you and everything must be analyzed by a certified laboratory. So you can go back and you can figure out patient A was exposed to this much THC, this much CBD, this much THCA, CBN, etc. and then correlate that with, with, with their outcomes. So that's the community-based model. It's been used before, but like I say, uh, the circumstances are not uh, less than ideal. It's not a placebo control thing. It's purely observational, but it's longitudinal. And, if, and, and the patient's contributing a lot of the data because they're keeping a lot and they're signing on, in online <laughs> and giving you their data so you can compare. There have been a, a lot of studies where they've given cannabis, usually THC, to patients with, say, sleep disorders, and then they put them through sleep studies. And they found no effect, but when they asked the patients, they all said that their sleep had improved like immensely, you know? So who's right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the technician running the, the, the uh, polysomnograph in the, in the sleep lab, or the patient who, who is reporting that experience? So that's why I think it's very important to, to have the patients involved in this. And the other thing is uh, vertical integration has been proposed as a way to make this happen. So in a particular state which doesn't allow one person to own things, you have to form a consortium so you have some control and quality control from the, from the, from the genetics and the cultivation 
the processing, packaging, dispensing, and its effects on that receptor are the primary motivation for that action of that molecule. And it turns out in cannabis, that's not the case. The cannabinoid receptors, of which we know there's at least two varieties, and possibly more, they're in very close association with other receptors, like the opioid receptors, okay? And when I, the term allosteric means that when THC or CBD binds to the cannabinoid receptor, it's not, that, it's not what that receptor does. It's that receptor has an effect on the neighboring receptor that is, that's, it's, that's in the lipid membrane with it, and that receptor determines the actual outcome. And that's why uh, THC, CBD, they act differently in different tissues depending on what the mix of receptors are, okay? So I can go through all these uh, different models and show that they're, uh, you know, what, their, what their benefits, what their drawbacks are, but then there wouldn't be time for any of the other speakers this morning, so I'm going to just kind of like let you see them and I'll tell you that I will make sure uh, through Kevin that everybody gets a copy of all the slides so you don't have to worry about uh, memorizing what you want there, and <laughs> even if you wanted to. Um, but, but I think this is the most important one. Most of our research is disease-centered, you know? We all know how it happens. The drug companies have these marketing experts, and they figure out what are the diseases where there's a lot of patients that are not getting enough uh, benefit from existing drugs, and where they or the insurance companies will pay tens of thousands of dollars if they develop a good drug for that. And that's what, that's what guides uh, pharmaceutical research. So you, you've all heard that you know, there's a dearth of new antibiotics coming around because they don't, there's no money in antibiotics. You, you, you give the antibiotics for you know, a couple of weeks or a month and then the patient is cured. The money is in chronic disease where, where the patient has to take that medicine for the rest of their life. So um, when you move from disease-centered to patient-centered, then you're talking about what are the symptoms, what are the limitations, what are the quality of life problems that the patient is having that they want to see you working on and they want to see results from your final uh, outcome. Now, people would object and say, well, those are subjective uh, evaluations. They're not going to stand up to the kind of rigor that a doctor's uh, uh, observation of your pain and so forth. But, we all know how doctors measure pain in patients, right? They hold up a little picture of with, with, with the five or ten faces, you know, from the happy face to the negative face, and they ask you where is the pain on that chart. So I don't think there's really that much difference between the patient's subjective um, reporting of their symptoms and the doctors. But the important thing is it's the needs of the patients that, that drive the research in this model. Um, and then, what we, what's done in the pharmaceutical industry is, if you have a molecule that works, then you make as many chemical modifications of that, and you screen them in the laboratory, either in animals, or if you have a, a, a test tube way to screen it, to look for the most potent ones, and then you, go, you take those and you put them into larger animals for toxicity studies, and if they get through that, those two levels, and then you go on to your earliest uh, human studies. But in clinical screening models, we don't have that, okay? Everything that we know, everything that we recommend to our patients is based on anecdotes. Anecdotes of patients that, that we've treated or that others have treated. Um, and uh, the studies you see published these days are all pilot studies, like of 17 patients that, that were given with, you know, that had pain of a certain level and were given THC and then put into a, an MRI and they measured blood flow in different parts of the brain and they showed that, that those with pain who responded to the cannabinoid, uh, there was a change in the blood flow to the regions that are important in, in the um, perception of pain. Okay? So, um, it's a whole different model, but I think 
if you combine these different models together, we're going to get something. So this is like a flow chart of how it would work under ideal circumstances. I've been meaning to put this flow chart together for years, so giving this presentation forced me to do it finally. So I apologize for the, uh, that it's not the best graphics in the world. But um, you see that at every stage, somebody is putting in uh, the data that they, that's needed, and then it's collected. Um, since every patient's data has a unique identifier, it can be linked, and then we create what's called a time sequence uh, longitudinal database, and then any, anybody can come in and say, okay, I want to look at the database and see what is, what are the, what's the best molecules for treating fibromyalgia of this sort in, in women, because you've got to always look at other variables as well. And um, anybody can use the data, but uh, we worked, the steering committee has already decided years ago that the first question was figuring out how we use cannabinoids to replace opioids for pain, because we saw this, this tsunami coming, you know, from 10 years ago. This is not something that just happened overnight. So this is another example of where our typical thinking and what's taught in medical school is very different from what's going on when you talk about cannabinoids. So here are some of the lessons learned that I think we have to keep in mind and make us all humble no matter you know, how much experience we have. And that sometimes everything that we learned in school or from the government or from you know, Time Magazine or wherever could be wrong, okay? Could be, could be the product of biases or uh, conflicts of interest and in cannabinoids when people ask, how can, how can this drug be, how can this plant be so good, so many things, and be, and be prohibited? My usual answer is follow the money. Because it's usually a money trail that tells you why it's, it's being uh, handled in the way it's being done. And whenever it comes to a new form of therapy, or in this case, a therapy that was discovered maybe 10,000 years ago, there's evidence it was being used in in, in ain't all kinds of ancient societies, including Egypt and, and uh, the Romans and so forth. So it's really it's being, it's being rediscovered after a millennium of suppression. It really is necessary to think outside the box about how you're going to handle that. Because the, the, the system has not worked for that. And that sing, the clinical research paradigms that are based on a single receptor binding to a single, uh, sing, a, a single ligand that may be an agonist or antagonist or partial or whatever, that's not going to work, that approach for uh, cannabinoids, because you need to have a mixture of different ligands, different cannabinoids, and maybe certain terpenoids. We're only learning now what you know, the terpenoids and other flavonoids in the cannabis uh, may contribute to its, its uh, healthy uh, effects. And, um, the other thing we know is that one approach alone is not going to solve this. You have to use as many approaches as possible. And the, the most beautiful thing in science is when you go at a problem from a lot of different angles, and they all converge on a, on a uniform answer. And so I hope that when I get invited back to speak here, I can tell you that we have learned some positive lessons. And it's not just um, these uh, things to avoid. Um, it was Hanukkah last week, so I sent all my friends, uh, my Jewish friends, this, this I call it my cannabis menorah, because it's like eight <laughs> <laughs> candles to it. But this is just to show us that we know how the, the endocannabinoid system works. We know what the receptors are, the primary receptors, the secondary receptors. We know how it's linked into all these other systems, and that's why it has so many uh, important functions. And we know that it always works in kind of a yin-yang way. Where you have an imbalance in the immune system or in, or in the metabolism of cells that leads to, to cancer or whatever, it works to bring that back into balance or homeostasis. That, that, that's really the basis of the entourage effect, restoring homeostasis. But it's a complicated set of paths. And, but on the other hand, it gives us a lot of things that we can measure in the blood 
as markers of both the disease process and the, and, and the cannabinoid effects. So we don't have to do a 10-year study of how uh, a certain particular cannabis uh, mixture affects uh, a very slow developing disease like osteoarthritis or something like that, diabetes or cancer. We, we, can, we can see on the short term, six months, year, two years, what's happening to the markers that we know represent the pathological state and the homeostatic state. And um, I have a prize for whoever knows what all those terms mean if I show me them. So I'm going to skip this one, except to go to the bottom here and say, I consider what you're doing here in Canada a great experiment. And it's an experiment that has to succeed. And that's why I'm so happy that you're all here today, because you're part of that. Um, this can succeed. You're going to have to all you know, get up to speed on, on, on how to use this and how to think about it and, and how it's not like uh, aspirin or the other drugs that you're taking. And that this is going to push the rest of the world, particularly the United States. Because right now what's happening is all the money being generated in the, quote, gray market of, of cannabis in the United States is all coming to Canada. Because they can't use the federal banking system or the stock markets and so forth. So my prediction is that's not going to last much longer. <laughs> so you're going to force us. And, and so... When you do something here in terms of changing the regulations, trying to help a certain group, say like expunging criminal records of people who've suffered under the old system, or giving an advantage to people in this crisis. And uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the 7,000 men who've been coming in every six months now for like 30, 40 years and giving their blood and their lymphocytes and their, all the data on everything about them that we can possibly ask in the time we have with them. Um, and um, it's really been one of the major sources of information about the, about the disease. And it's going to take something like that, but at a community-based level, uh, to solve this problem. And also that uh, I think the, the patients and the activists in this field could do very well to learn from what AIDS activists did, is to you know, really you know, stick it to the man and tell him, why aren't you researching? Why aren't you funding research of this type and so forth? And um, with that, I'm going to stop. I hope I left some time for questions, but if I will tell me, I will sit down. <laughs> feel that um, cross-border cross collaboration is, is, is important because every, every person, every field, every specialty, every individual, they all contribute something to this. And um, you have a, you have, you're developing a certain model for um, legalizing recreational. Uh, along the line, sometimes when you go full recreational, a lot of the things that are necessary to research on medical cannabis get kind of pushed to the side. So that's something that we're trying to be very cautious about because in the United States we do it one state at a time. So there are different models being tried in different states to see to what extent we can keep collecting data on the medical side and not have all the patients go to the recreational uh, dispenser. Uh, but you're actually right. Canada's really uh, done a lot. and. Uh, you had like the first uh, North American Professional Association, the CCIC, that did a lot of education and training of doctors and so forth. But the point I'm, I was making uh, about AIDS is that it's our attitudes and beliefs that drive what we do, our thinking and our actions. And we have to acknowledge that we all have biases about cannabis based on decades of uh, propaganda about its negative effects, okay? 
And you have to acknowledge that before you can free yourself from that and, and begin to think of it in, in a new and different way. So that's really the main uh, point I make from the story. Just want to make a comment. You just made a comment about the differences between U.S. law and Canadian law. So you should all understand that in Canada, uh, in 1982, we became a constitutional democracy. And one of the constitutional rights that you all have is the right to life, liberty, and the security of your person, and the right not to have that taken away arbitrarily from you. So not in accordance with principles of fundamental justice, is what our Constitution says. So, in Canada, a medically approved patient has a right to reasonable access to cannabis. That we established 18 years ago, and of course, and reaffirmed it recently. So, if a doctor says that you require this form of medical condition, uh, you have that right of reasonable access to prevent the violation of your constitutional rights. And that's, a, I think, a big distinction between the U.S. and Canada. Yeah, it's a very big distinction because one of the most frequent complaints I hear is, my doctor won't prescribe it to me, or if I tell them I'm getting it elsewhere, they'll stop treating me for the condition they're treating me for. And I think that's unconscionable. And I always say to them, change doctors. But unfortunately, we have the thing in the United States called managed care. So very often, people's insurance doesn't allow them to change doctors. They're stuck in a particular network of doctors. Right. So there's a lot of issues. And I know you're one of the specialists on it. And I, I look forward to hearing much more about the legal and ethical issues that, that uh, this revolution of cannabinoid medicine and, and, and uh, any prohibition that we're going to bring so thank you very much. There was a question. One more question. Is, uh, can I ask? So, we'll take two since you're All right. Is, uh, in the United States, OPOs are covered by insurance companies. What about prescribed marijuana? Um, just a few have begun. They're, 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 you know how insurance companies are. They kind of sit back and they wait to see. But... Sooner or later, they're going to realize it's a lot cheaper for them to pay for marijuana than to pay for the next, you know, blockbuster genetic drug that costs four hundred. dollars No, there is a reason for this question. I was in Vegas recently, went to the dispensary. The first question was, do you have a prescription? I say, no, it's legal. I want to buy recreational. Why do you ask me for a prescription? She said, if you have a prescription, you pay really cheap. Yeah, you don't pay taxes. Uh, that, that, that's true in a lot of states. The, the taxes are, are not... Uh, ah, so it has nothing to do with insurance then. Okay, I it got it. doesn't have to do with your okay. to do with taxes. I got it. But in a state like Illinois that only has medical, they tax it to bill. Okay. Last question. I got Sorry. it. Last one. Uh, thank you for the amazing presentation. Just had a quick question about... Uh, you mentioned the fact that the new model has been applied. Well, the, uh, the whole MAC study was an example of that. Because okay. it was like five different communities coming together and saying, we're not going to do five separate studies. We're going to standardize our instruments. We're going to collect the same data, and we're going to be able to do the study much faster and, and, and find out what's causing this disease and what its pathophysiology is, and then, and then test the new drugs. Um, and, and that was an amazing thing to see happen because usually investigators, they write their grant. They want to do their grant. They don't want to do somebody else's grant. So getting all these high-power people in one room to agree on what the questions were and how we're going to do it was a battle, but it made, it made the study so much stronger and better. And that's not going to be done for our job before, though, because we don't, not really it, uh, It's not been done by, by, by pharmaceutical companies, and you don't, you know, you hear more and more because... I know we're going to go on a break. I'm just going to thank Dr. Ostra for his amazing work that he's been doing. And uh, I just wanted to mention one last thing that we're super lucky that we live in Canada, um, <laughs> where it is federally legal. And I know that Dr. Ostro is talking about research and uh, the difficulty of performing clinical studies and clinical research on cannabis in the United States. In Canada, we don't really have that problem. Um, where research around cannabinoids, is, as you'll see later from my presentation from others, uh, is, is fairly open here. And you're able to do it as long as you go through the right channels. The issue becomes funding. And, uh, and currently, you know, I sat on the panel a couple weeks ago, I think one of the 
the, the, well, the guy sitting next to me made a really good point. Um, and to, the takeaway from that was LPs are currently, or the licensed producers of cannabis, uh, the LPs are currently quite short-sighted for, um, for a big cash-out, right? At least that's what they thought was going to happen with the recreational market. But if you look at the, if you look at the total global market cap on, on recreational cannabis, and this is a little off topic, it's about 500, let's say 500 billion. If you look at the market cap on the pharmaceutical world, you're looking at three trillion at minimum. So the the answer still, and that's how we that's how we like that's how we can you know frame it to the licensed producers and the funders of, of research. That's how I do it, and then we're able to get funding. <laughs> so you have to sort of play their game a little bit in order to make it sexy for them and want to do the research. So there are LPs out there right now that recognize that and aren't just looking at the uh, at the short game which is this recreational world the medical world in Canada uh, is 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 tremendous see we forgot you know something we had, a lot of the healthcare practitioners here thought was going to happen was come legalization we thought that the medical market was going to start going down but the medical market has almost tripled in the last month our referral rates have gone through the roof and something we forgot you know we didn't take into consideration is that Canadians like healthcare and they like going to their doctors where the market we were looking at to compare it to were things like the United States. We were looking at uh, Colorado and we were looking at California and we we're looking at places where people don't go to a doctor as often because, well, you're going to end up broke. So, you know, but here, I we still pay for it, don't get me wrong, we just pay for it differently. So, um, I think that, you know, from those, if we start, you know, uh, framing the argument in that way to licensed producers and to investors, research will even open up even further and we'll be able to get the funding we need. So thank you very much. I know we're going on to break right now. I'll just let... It's funny, Dr. Ira Price is a half hour this afternoon and between everything else, he's probably going to be speaking for an hour plus today. Thank you for that, though. Uh, just a couple announcements. We're going to go to break uh, and have a quick coffee break. We've got two presentations before lunch and um, lunch will be served out here. And I want to tell you, when I came to Vancouver, I'm a hockey fan, I want to go see the Canucks play. Of course, they're not playing while we're here. But my friends aren't too smart, so I went in front of the Rogers Arena, took some photos, and I put them on social media. So they all thought I had a great time last night. But speaking of social media, we are on social media, on Facebook, OcannabisConf, and on Twitter and Instagram as well. So we encourage you to take pictures.